Welcome into another edition of What Barry's Talking About from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely. On this week's program, an incredible journey for a Barry family, for a relative they did not know existed. We sit down with a former Barry 360 colleague to hear how her adventure started and where it has taken her and her family. And we get our weekly Barry Colts update. The conversations start after this. This is what Barry's talking about from Barry 360. I'm Dan Blakely, welcoming back an old friend, a former <laughs> colleague, someone who helped put us on the map when we started, oh, three, four years ago, Hinda Kozakulp. Hi. Nice to see you. It's nice. Always great to see you. You left to do some uh, other things, some new adventures uh, in the working world, but you went on another adventure in the summer that had nothing to do with work. It was all about family, and this was really, really exciting for you. What, uh, what was it? It was very exciting for me, yeah. Um, where to start? Well, I guess um, I guess I'll start at the beginning. Start so. at the beginning. That's always <laughs> it's a, a good, good spot. place. Yeah. Uh, my my great grandmother, uh, her name was Clara, and she came to Canada in 1928 from a town called Kalinivka, which is in what is now considered Ukraine, but at the time was Soviet Russia. She left with my nine month old grandfather in tow. She was going to meet her husband, who had immigrated the year before. She was. 22 years old and she never saw her family ever again Um, after the war she got a letter from the Red Cross telling her that her family had been wiped out in the Holocaust killed by the Nazis Um, and we were always told that you know it was so painful for her she never really spoke of her family Um, so as a result we didn't have a lot of information about that side of the family fast forward a few years um, about 10 years ago, I was pregnant with my daughter and we were trying to come up with a name, what we could call her. And in Judaism, it's a a tradition to name your child after somebody who's passed away. Um, And so we were, you know, playing with different names, this grandmother, that grandmother. And my dad said, why don't you name her after my bubby, his grandmother, um, Clara? And it just kind of stuck with us and um, we really liked it. And the more I thought about it and I kind of learned more about her my great grandmother's story I thought well what a what a strong woman to you know to give my daughter this name so then a couple of years ago uh, my great auntie Esther who was my like big Clara's <laughs> daughter you've spoken of her I remember yes yes her and I are very close um, she gave me a family photo and um, some of my great grandmother's other things her immigration documents and things like that and she she wanted me to have them because they're my daughter's named after her mother and she gave me the photo. It has my great grandmother in it, and all of her siblings and her parents. And it is the only photo we have of of that family. And she said, "You know, it makes me really sad. I don't know any of their names." I she knew um, her grandparents' names, so my great grandmother's parents' names. Um, but she said, "I don't know any of their names because my mother never spoke of them. It was too difficult for her." And that sort of started something in the back of my brain. I thought, well, there has to be a record of them somewhere. You know, my my great-grandmother got this letter from the Red Cross. It has to exist. I I can find this. How how hard could this be? (laughs) If anybody could find it, Hinda could find it. (laughs) Well, uh, once I put my mind to something, I am am nothing if not determined. So I sort of set out and um, picked away at it a little bit. But I really, you know, I'm not a genealogist. I had no idea where to start. And funnily enough, a lot of people I think don't realize this, but you can actually access genealogical resources for free with your library card. Oh. Um, fun fact. <laughs> so that's where I started um, at the library. You can access Ancestry.ca and actually I was able to find the ship manifest that my um, my great grandmother when she came over from, funnily enough, the UK, which we didn't really realize either. She landed in the UK first and then came to Canada. The ship manifest had her hometown, um, her parents' names, and some other information on it that was super helpful because up until that point, I had just been kind of searching. I didn't know the name of her hometown. Um, So that was extremely helpful. Um, And that led me to other resources. Um, Specifically, there's a website called Jewish Genealogy where I was able to access some, um, some other records. During this time where I'm searching, I have this photo at home and my friend was visiting and I said to him, he's very interested in history, and I said, you know, I'm trying to find this information on my, my family. Do you have any idea, like, where could I look for this? What could I do? And he said, have you ever taken the back off the photo? 
And I was like, can you imagine if this has been hanging on my Auntie Esther's wall all this time Mm -hmm. and the names are on the back? So at this point, you know, we were just like sitting around and we opened it. It was like a a scene out of a TV show. We were all like, oh, my God, what's (laughs) happening here? And I mean, not to it sounds like I'm building up to something. There were no names on the back of the photo, but there was a note written from Yosef Litvak, who is my great grandmother's father. Wow. Yeah. And it was dated 1923. It was written in Yiddish, which I don't read. So I actually put it on Reddit to see if anybody <laughs> could translate it. And within by the by the next morning, it had been translated. And it said, um, to, my, to my dear daughter, for eternal memory uh, of your family, love your mother and your father, Yosef Litvak, dated 1923. So over 100 years old. And that really sparked something in me. I was like, this is a, this is a real person. This, you know, you know, it made it come alive. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I really kind of set my mind to like, I was going to find out everything I could about this. Um, I joined a couple of Facebook groups that are specifically about, you know, sort of finding broken family links or families that have been broken up because of the Holocaust. And actually I learned that in 2022, Yad Vashem, which is the Holocaust Memorial Museum in Israel, in Jerusalem, Mm -hmm. put all of their records online. So I was able to search for my great grandmother's last name, her maiden name, and I found a list of her family. So at some point in 1999, um, someone who was a granddaughter of Yosef and Golda Litvak, my great grandmother's parents, had submitted pages of testimony in memory of her family. But if there's a granddaughter of these people that I don't know, that meant another sibling had to survive. So immediately this sets off, you know, I'm calling my Auntie Esther. I'm calling every, you never believe what I found. (laughs) But again, these pages were submitted in written in Russian. So I have no idea what they say. So you've learned a lot of new languages along the way, right? <laughs> yeah, I've, really, I've picked up a little bit here and there. But thankfully, we live in 2024, and there's all sorts of tools to be able to help you translate these things. Um, so I was able to find the name and the, the address, at least the address from 1999 of the person who had submitted them. And that person was, um, I came to learn, had been dece- had passed away. Um, but I came to find her brother, was still alive, um, living in Israel. And he was, he's the son of my great grandmother's younger sister who had survived the war um, because her husband was a soldier in the Russian army. And as a result, she had been um, evacuated into the interior during the war. So she survived. I I can't really even describe what that moment was like, like realizing there was, but then the problem became, how are we going to find this person and, you know, connect with him? So when I had initially gotten in touch with Yad Vashem and I asked them for any other information, they had said, the only information we have is what's on this piece of paper. But they put me in touch with another um, department in Israel, which is called Mogan David Adam. And they have a particular um, department called Restoring Family Links. So I sent an email and I said, here's what I found. You know, I know that the woman who submitted these pages has passed away, but I think that she has other family, but I don't know where I keep hitting dead ends. And it's especially hard because of the language barrier. Any any help would be so appreciated. It was then the most like three most excruciating days of my life, checking my email constantly. I finally got an email back and they said, yes, we've contacted your uh, family, whose name was also Yosef, uh, named after his grandfather. Um, And he knew that he had family in Canada, but uh, he, you know, he he didn't know anything about you. He's very eager to speak to you. Here's his phone number. Here's his email address. But he only speaks Hebrew and Russian, not really any English. So I have other family in Israel. I got them to call him, which seems strange. And the next morning at 6 a.m., which is about, you know, middle of the afternoon Israel time, my phone is ringing off the hook and it's my dad. And he's saying, we're going to bring you into the call, like a, you know, a conference call. He said, I'm on the phone with Yosef, who would this man would be my fa- my grandfather's first cousin, my father's father's first right, cousin. Right. And he said to uh, he said, yes, Clara. I know my mother's sister, Clara. She lived in Canada. We tried to find her because they lived in Russia until the early 90s and then immigrated to Israel. 
So there was really no communication with the Western world from Russia at that time. So when they finally moved to Israel, they had tried to find her. But by that point, my great grandmother had been passed away. So we were so blown away by this. We agreed to have a Zoom call the next day. My Auntie Esther was very excited to potentially, you know, meet over Zoom her first cousin. And he said to us, I have some photos, a box of photos of my mother's. I'll scan them and send them to you. So the next morning I wake up and there's an email from this man with photos and things. And I start looking through and he had photos of my family. He had photos of my grandfather, of my Auntie Esther. And I, it made no sense because we believed that Clara had believed her whole family had been killed. So we could not figure out how they had these photos from, from the, you know, from after the war, like of my Auntie Esther when she was 15 years old in 1945, of my grandfather at 18 in his army uniform. I called my dad like, I don't understand what's happening here. This doesn't make any sense. And my dad said, well, I guess we'll find out. As it turns out, at some point in the early 1960s, my great grandmother learned that her sister had survived. She never told anybody. She wrote a letter to her sister, Celia. She, so what happened was uh, when my great grandfather came to Canada, he came on the ship with a friend of his from his hometown. My great grandfather went to Canada and his friend went to Mexico City and settled there. So in the early 60s, 1961 or 62, uh, my great grandparents went on a trip. It's the only time in their entire lives they took a vacation. They went to Mexico to visit their friends. And during that time, somebody there said to my great grandmother, no, your sister Celia survived. She's alive. She lives in Moscow. And so she wrote a letter, which there's a very good chance I will cry if I read this to you, but it is perhaps the most heart-wrenching letter I have ever by this. So the letter was written in uh, December 14th, 1962. My dear, dear Cyril, today I got your address for which I waited so many years. I don't even know where to start, but I beg you, my dear, write to me. Let me hear from you. No sea or border can now separate me from you. When I hear from you, I will write about myself. If you can, write everything about yourself. I want to know everything. I ask you again, dear Celia, write to me. Don't let me suffer. With that, I finish until I hear from you. Stay healthy, Chaika, which is like the nickname for her. Mm -hmm. So that was in 1962. In 1963, there's another letter. At that time, it was very difficult to communicate with the Western world. It was mm -hmm. forbidden. Mm -hmm. So even the fact that this woman, my great aunt Celia, great great aunt Celia, kept this letter in a box of her most precious things her entire life was a was a an act of rebellion in a way you know her neighbors could have reported her if they knew you were communicating with someone in the west um she may have at some point tried to you know connect with write a letter through different ways or but um nonetheless no no communication came through my great grandmother wrote another letter a year later the same thing saying please write to me begging her sister to write to her um, and she never, she never got a letter back as far as we know. From there, we were able to discover the names of the siblings in the photo based on the pages of testimony that had been submitted in the ages. And then we also were able to learn their fates. So um, two of my great-grandmother's sisters, um, Nina and Basha, were killed at Babinyar in Kiev, which is one of the largest massacres of Jewish people in Ukraine um, during World War II, along with their children. Their sister, Manya, was also killed at Babinyar. And then the, their, her parents and her youngest sister, Riva, who was only 22, they stayed in Kalinivka. In 1942, the Nazis invaded Kalinivka. They put all the Jews into a ghetto in May of that month, or in May of that year they liquidated the ghetto and all the Jews were killed. This is a very sad part of the story, but in a way some closure, I guess, to know the fates of, of our family and what happened to them course, and to be, yes. able to, to be able to honor them. But it did have uh, somewhat of a happy ending, so we were able to coordinate a visit. Um, so my 
So Yosef, who is Celia's do- uh, son, and his daughter and her husband told us we're, we're coming to Canada for a visit. It is one of, if not the most, one of the most impactful moments of my life. That that point in time where, you know, I opened the door and my Auntie Esther saw her first cousin for the first time will just stay in my heart for the rest of my life. It's remarkable. It, it felt like it felt like family from the minute we met them. I, it's hard to put into words. It never, it didn't feel, I mean, you know, we said, of course, come to Canada. You can stay with us with no thought of like, what if these, you know, <laughs> we don't, essentially they're strangers. What are we getting into here? But they're wonderful and so um, lovely and just fit with our family like they had been there all along. And it's so remarkable. Some of the things, you know, um, my auntie Esther and her cousin Yosef are very physically similar. Um, little things like yeah, we had a, a, a Shabbat dinner at my auntie Esther's house and certain recipes. He said, my mother would make this or my mother would have that. And Yosef kept saying that auntie Esther looks exactly like his mother and sounds like her and acts like her. And which is interesting because auntie Esther it, uh, allegedly, I never knew Clara, but um, it was nothing like her mother. <laughs> By all accounts, Clara was, uh, she's a very tiny woman, you know, barely five feet tall, very soft-spoken, very gentle. Um, and to think that she, by herself, at 22 years old, first got on a train from Kalinivka to go to Riga, Latvia, where she took a, a ship, which most likely wasn't even a ship, you know, made for, for humans. It was made to move cattle through the, through the Black Sea up to Southampton in the UK and then take a trip across the ocean to Canada, didn't speak a word of English, had a baby in tow, and all the things that go into taking care of a, a small baby. Like, what a, what a remarkable woman. And, yeah, a little, you know, just so many little things, so many similarities between the two sisters. They never spoke of their family. They kind of lived with this sadness their whole lives. Clara and Celia had so much stolen from them so much time family memories but we we got to take a little bit of it back yeah. you know when was the visit uh it was the f- the first uh weekend in september and how much communication has there been back and forth since <laughs> lots <laughs> <laughs> lots yeah we're very lucky you know now we live in a world where we can um text or send them a message on WhatsApp, um, an email, which is really nice. My Auntie Esther is not one for technology, so she doesn't have a cell phone or anything like that. But, um, you know, we set up Zoom calls so that she can see them. And um, we're hoping one day to be able to go to Israel and have a a visit there because it's, um, yeah, it's, it's just... I still don't, I don't know that I'll ever have the words to describe what this you is like. Yeah. You never will. You never, and you yeah. don't need them. Yeah. You, you, yeah. you, you have this memory, you have mm-hmm. this, this experience that uh, just circumvents everything. Yeah. I'm curious how this impacted on your kids, particularly your daughter, Clara. Yeah, it, it's so interesting. Um, my kids are, my son is in his bar mitzvah year, so he has been particularly interested in our family history and, um, you know, even just just general history. He's learning a lot about World War II in school. And, um, at, and I think for my kids to see this connection to their history in a way and feel this connection to their family has been really amazing. My daughter, I don't know that she understands, you know, she's only 10. I don't know that she understands sort of the weight of it or what it means, but she definitely got a lot of attention from everybody (laughs) for being named Clara. Um, And she is very, the the family resemblance is is strong amongst all of us. Um, So, you know, she looks very similar to some of the, you know, the family photos, some of the littler faces, she looks very similar. So I think they've, it's hard to describe what that weekend was like with I'm hesitant to use the word magical but that is what it felt like it was that we were together every day like Friday night we had a dinner Saturday we were Saturday we were at my parents house Sunday we were at my uncle's house Monday we were at my other uncle's house and we just had these four days of getting to know one another and spending time and it was truly like this bubble of just happiness and joy 
and for my kids and their cousins and me and my cousins to get to have that experience because, you know, we didn't even know that these people existed. And now they're a part of our family tree and they didn't know we exist and they have a much smaller family on that side than we have here. So they came into, you know, there's a big group of us. My my Auntie Esther had four kids. My grandfather had four kids. Each one of those four kids had at least one kid of their own. And now there's, you know, various assorted grandchildren yep, and things. That family tree keeps so, planting yeah, roots, yeah, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. So we have, uh, we have a big family to for them to come into and it's it's um yeah it's it's overwhelming you started this journey with some uh, poking around at the library other people may be in the same position as you don't know where to begin so yeah. give them a, a reader's digest uh, cole's notes version of uh, where they need to start looking yeah yeah uh, go into the library and ask um i know that you can book a genealogy coach through the library there's all sorts of resources whether it's you know ontario newspapers or ancestry family search you would be amazed at the things you can find even if you know you're not searching out lost family or searching for someone you will learn so much it's so interesting the, all the records that you can see that you can find to learn little bits I never knew my great grandmother but I have learned so much about her as a person her journey what it must have been like and it's really informed for me a lot of sort of you know how now how my family operates I'm like oh well this you know this makes a lot of sense or that makes a lot of sense and it's you get this picture of them as a whole person as opposed to just this you know person on the wall yeah. that you think well yeah. who you know who's this old you've heard person. a little bit about yeah you know she and and you might be surprised at what you find if you just go in and ask um and it's all free with your library card so it's not costing you anything you may as well give it a try who knows what you'll find oh uh, look what you found exactly <laughs> incredible journey for you i'm so happy that you were able to to take that journey and and uh, learn what you've learned and uh, find some new family thanks so much for sharing it oh my pleasure thanks for having me the Barry Colts are in the thick of it in the OHL Central Division. Six wins and three losses to start the season. Three more games this week in hopes of climbing closer to the top of the heap. We get an update from Barry 360's Will Conkin and Colts broadcaster and writer Gene Pereira. Here we go, Gene. Colts have now rattled off five wins in their last six games, uh, but for their recent two, it was a 4-3 shootout victory over the Owen Sound attack, and then 5-3 against the Ottawa 67s. Um, what are some uh, sticking points you took away from these games? The the organization did pick up its uh, 1,000th win. Yeah, obviously that was a nice milestone for the hockey club, and they needed five coming into the year, and you really start to see this Colts team now for, you know, they expected to be a team that was a contender, and they're really starting to roll here, uh, you know, putting the back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back wins together here. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was that thousandth win, obviously, a nice milestone for the, for the hockey club and celebrating their 30th anniversary. So, um you know, you just get the sense that this team is really coming together. And, uh, you know, the shootout win over Owen Sound. Uh, Owen Sound proved a tougher foal on Thursday. They're in a rebuilding year. But, uh, you know, again, when it came to the shootout, you could see the real difference. Uh, obviously, a Revic, another great start net for the young netminder uh, against Owen Sound. And then, you know, Hemi and Bowdoin, which is absolute two highlight reel type uh, goals in the shootout to win it uh, was the difference but uh, you know again uh, off to a good start and uh, and then they head into Sunday afternoon in Ottawa where you know first periods haven't been really uh, you know a very strong suit this season just one goal in the first period but even though they didn't score uh, in the nation's capital on Sunday in the first period uh, they had a pretty solid first and uh, it was a bit of a wild back and forth second period but uh, you know you had the sense that Barry was always in control and uh, they came out with a lead in that one and then third period really kind of locked things down and then they get the empty net and a nice uh, set up by Hemming uh, to Weigel but uh, you know you get the, the, the sense that this team's really coming together. Riley Patterson and uh, Bodie Stewart, uh, they're still looking strong, uh, looking strong too. Yeah, Patterson, three goals in his last two games, and again, he had that two-game suspension there, and uh, uh, you know, you really just start to see the fact that, you know, he's 
he's uh, him and Bowden. That chemistry is is coming back. And Ty York. I mean, uh, the three of them uh, just seem to you know that work that magic. And uh, with Patterson now, uh, you know, get on the scoreboard uh, the last game, you really get the sense of just how deep this hockey club is. And you know, Bodie Stewart, another guy who's yet to score, but seven assists in nine games. And you know, he's one of those guys that go under the radar, but if you watch him shift in and shift out, you know, you just get the sense that there's there's so much more there. And uh, you know, he's been really good these last few games, and uh, uh, you know, getting top six minutes and deserving of it. But you know, again, for this hockey club, they're they're a deep hockey uh, hockey club, and uh, you know, that's what's kind of overwhelming uh, the uh, other teams is that they can kind of just uh, you know send line after line out there. Talking about their depth, uh, looking forward, Captain Bo Gelsma and Kayshawn Aitchison expected to return to the lineup this week, right? Yeah, I mean, obviously, Bo Gelsma, the captain, uh, you know, big return, injured his shoulder uh, in camp with the Pittsburgh Penguins. And, uh, you know, on the ice, obviously, Bo brings so much as uh, ability to score. And uh, just, uh, but, you know, it's his leadership. I mean, uh, these guys seem to really follow Bo and, uh, uh, you know, uh, they look up to him, and uh, I, I think just the energy he's going to bring. And I, I know, Gels, but that it must have been really difficult these last few weeks uh, sitting out, and he's going to be anxious to get back to the lineup. And it's going to be such a huge uh, boost for the team. And then he got Keyshawn Aitchison, who's uh, completed his two game suspension. He returns, and uh, uh, again, just a big boost to the blue line. He was off to a great start. This is his NHL draft year. And uh, Keyshawn has just really, you know, stepped his game up to another level. On deck for the Colts, they host the Erie Otters tonight at Sadlin, then head to Brampton to play the Steelheads Friday, then back home Saturday for a match with the Guelph Storm. Um, their first three and three for the group. What are you expecting from them during this stretch? Yeah, three and threes are always difficult, to end. Uh, you know, it's it's obviously uh, the back to back to back nights, and that's where you really rely on the depth. And this is a much deeper, buried team, and that you know Marty Williamson can roll his four lines and not really have to lean on one or two lines, and uh, you know that can really wear you out during uh, you know kind of a busy stretch. But uh, you know it's it's going to get it's going to be a tough one. They face a really good eerie team on Thursday uh, in the Brampton, which is. Has uh, been struggling a bit of late, but they're a really good hockey club, obviously. And uh, you know, you know, Saturday with Guelph as well, so it, it's it's going to be a tough stretch. And uh, you know, nice to see Case on Aitchison as well get uh, invited to that prospects game against the the U.S. Uh, national uh, junior team, the under 18s in a, a two game series. It's brand new. Uh, the top NHL prospects, and no surprise that Case on Aitchison was named to that team. Always appreciate the insight, Gene. Till next time. Thanks, Will. And that's our program for this week. Thanks to Will for his input, to Matt Ladder for his technical expertise, and to you for listening. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to What Barry's Talking About, rate it, review it. You can also keep up with What Barry's Talking About on X at Barry360, on our website, barry360.com, and there's our daily Kickstart podcast available from any streaming service and on our website. I'm Dan Blakely. Hope you'll join us again next week.